Hi guys, and welcome again to Life Design Diaries, the business and lifestyle podcast. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Tristan Thomas, who is the head of marketing and community at Monzo. Monzo is a bank of the future. Since they started, they've been busy building the best current account in the world, and they've now more than a million customers using their debit cards. Unlike traditional banks, Monzo have no high street premises. Instead, their service is provided by their app, making it convenient and relevant for their customers. To give you an insight into just how popular this bank is becoming, recently they raised an additional 20 million from a crowdfunding campaign, 18 million of which came in just two hours and 45 minutes. Now, people who use Monzo often turn into raving fans. Think about it. When was the last time you heard someone raving about a bank? Tristan has pretty much been there from the start to drive this success, and he's only 26. So please enjoy my conversation with Tristan Thomas. Thanks for joining us, Tristan. Thank you for having me. How are you today? Yeah, all good. Looking forward to the uh, the Christmas break now. It's sort of the chaos just before uh, before everyone leaves. <laughs> it is. Are you trying to just fit everything in in this last week? Yeah, and it's not going very well, but uh, part of the fun, I guess. Yeah. Now, this interview is actually rescheduled, wasn't it? Because we were, we were going to go the day after the, your crowdfunding campaign success. Yes. Um, and you actually lost your voice. So do you, what happened there? Totally, un- totally unrelated, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I want to start by talking about that crowdfunding campaign, though. For those that don't know, uh, last week, Monzo closed a crowdfunding campaign. You, you raised 20 million, didn't you? And um, 18 million of that came in just two hours, 45 minutes. So um, do you want to tell me about how that felt, first of all? Yeah, it was, it was amazing. We'd, um, we'd been building up to this crowdfunding campaign for many, many months and gone through a, a very long process to get there. So writing what's called a prospectus, which is 200 page document outlining everything about the business, uh, going through lots and lots of uh, fun discussions with our lawyers and with the regulators. And so then when the day came, um, frankly, we really didn't know how it was going to go. Uh, really? We, we'd, given, we'd given a week for this crowdfunding campaign. Okay. Um, and for a week or two before, I woke up on alternate nights, either stressing out that it wouldn't sell out and we'd raise about five million and look stupid, or that it would uh, be so popular that we would accidentally take out the servers and take down the bank. Um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the morning what one, off, le- what one were you leaning towards? Um, well, I thought that I thought the latter would be more exciting and would definitely <laughs> be good from a PR point of view, although probably not good from a sort of long term customer retention point of view. So um, I was I was hoping it would go quite quickly in my really sort of optimistic times i thought it would take a day or two um and so then on the morning when when it was going up so fast and we suddenly realized that it was going to go in a couple of hours it was both a relief but also uh slightly panicky as we then realized everything else that we needed to do had to be done in about two hours (laughs) yeah 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 what were you doing during those two hours what was like go live what did that look like in the office so we went live at 10 a.m. and we had a, a sort of war room of, of 15 core people um, across engineers and uh, marketing people and designers to make sure that we had everything we needed if, if things went wrong. Um, and at, at 10 a.m. everything went live and the first 40 seconds, nothing happened. And at that point, uh, we started to gently panic um she panicked after 40 seconds so that is obviously high expectation well the number the number hadn't changed right okay. uh, no literally nobody had invested anything <laughs> and, and logically that made sense they had to go through a flow and answer a sort of quiz to make sure that they understood the risks and things but yeah um when you're in that moment and your, your heart's beating 40 seconds felt like a very long time <laughs> but then very very quickly sort of the next five minutes we could see it going up and um i guess within 20 minutes or half an hour we'd hit 10 million so uh at that point it became clear that that this was going going pretty well um and actually i think it found found the right balance in terms of timing in that what we struggled with in the past is crowdfunding around selling out too quickly and so lots of people missing out yeah and the nice thing about doing it over a couple of hours is that 
everybody who's really, really keen and wants to invest uh, is basically able to get in and is sort of guaranteed a slot. So anyone who did try at 10 o'clock or 10.05 definitely got in. Uh, but it, it still goes fast enough that we're not we're not worried about it taking too long or um, looking embarrassed at the end yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's awesome. I bet it, um, that feeling of like, the fact that you just raised that amount of money it's just it's just it's hard to kind of imagine especially so how long have you been at monzo now three years now so uh, yeah and did you kind of could you have foreseen you know going back three years that that you know that scenario that day would happen no not at all um the first crowdfunding round we did was a million pounds and that went very very quickly uh, i went in a minute and a half but um even then that felt like our it felt like we could only go downhill from there. Right, um, yeah, yeah. So getting to 20 million and, and doing that at, at the same sort of speed was just, was ridiculous. Um, yeah. That afternoon after we'd raised, it felt very, very surreal. Everyone sort of walked away and went back to work and got on with a normal afternoon, but just felt a little uh, little unusual. Mm. <laughs> so so why did you even decide to do that then? And who, whose decision was to go down that route of crowdfunding? Yeah, so for us, crowdfunding is it's the pinnacle of the way we approach community and our customers. So ever since we've started, we've always tried to involve customers in everything we do at every step of the process. So early on when we were tiny, that meant running hackathons and inviting people into our offices. Um, The first 5,000 customers, we gave a card to every single person individually in person and we met them. And you just have this incredible bond with your customers, which is both, really nice from a a sort of feelings point of view, but is also hugely, hugely powerful. Yeah. uh, Because it means that those customers are incredibly engaged in what, in what we were doing. They would give us amazing feedback. They would help us decide on what features we should build next um, and tell us when things were going wrong. And, and in return where our huge biggest advocates would tell all of their friends about Monzo and help to fuel a lot of that early growth. And so then as we grew and, grew from 100,000 to 500,000 to a million customers. We wanted to find ways to involve people in in that same way, to give us and them that same feeling that we had when we were giving them a card individually. And so we do we do a lot of things. We run an online forum that has about 40,000 people in it. We do 10 events a month here in our offices getting people in. But crowdfunding just felt like the the pinnacle of that of really letting people own a piece of the company yeah letting them hopefully be a part of the success um and helping them to get even more bought in quite literally into what we're doing and and that has a a lot of benefits for us those people are again hugely engaged they give us a lot of feedback they help us to decide on new features and and naming and a, a whole bunch of stuff um but it also felt like our way to give back to our customers who frankly helped us to get to where we are today. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we ran the first one and that was hugely successful, um, maybe too successful. And so then have been sort of steadily getting bigger and bigger since then. Um, and so now we have 35,000 people who own a piece of Monzo and they also help us decide pricing for new features and, help us decide on new names and help us decide what we should build next and come and ask questions of uh, us at events and um, don't hold back at those as well, which is, which is great. And so you just change how people interact. I mean, definitely interact with the bank, but interact with most companies. I I think there are very few companies that bring in their customers as much as we try to do. Yeah, hundred percent. Like when I think of Monzo, it's so clear that you're so transparent in everything you do, and you know you only have to go on the website for for a minute and see that you're you're literally putting all of that out there um, in in everything that you do. But where where did that come from? Was that was that a very conscious decision at the start? Was that something to do with hmm. you know talk about the narrative of the old banks and how they operate and actually you're going to be a brand new challenger bank is going to be completely different. Is that, where did this kind of value of being open and honest and transparent and everything you do come from? Kind of by accident, honestly. Um, 
it's it's very easy to look back on a lot of these decisions and see them as incredibly strategic, uh, strategic yeah. brand decisions and separating Absolutely. us from the competition. Um, but as with with almost everything, I think in business, but especially in startups, you you find things by accident. Sometimes that's intentionally finding things by accident. So pushing on lots and lots of different doors to see which one opens and then pushing harder on that. And sometimes, uh, like it was with us for transparency and community to an extent, um, it came about because uh, that's just how we wanted to run a business at the beginning. It felt like it aligned with our, everybody's personal values. Um, yeah. And especially when you're starting out, I think it's very easy to forget all of the, you sort of, you see companies that are doing really, really well and being hugely successful. And uh, you read profiles of them in the media and it just looks like they followed a, a sort of very clear set of instructions and steps to get to where they are. And now they're a billion dollar company. And we found, I mean, that's so obviously not the case when you're actually doing it. Yeah. And instead it's a mixture of accidents and chaos and panic and um, all of that sort of thing on an ongoing basis. And so sharing some of that with the wider community just felt like the, the right thing to do. Uh, and especially in banking, there was definitely some of that, that the banks had been traditionally very, very opaque. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah it, and, and people then resonated with it. And so a combination of us wanting to do it and customers really, really valuing it means that we've now, again, pushed on that door even harder and sort of asked ourselves, how, how far can we go here? How, how much can we share? Yeah. And to give an example of this kind of transparency, which really took, grabbed my attention. So I'm a Monzo user, you know, we, we me and Lucy have been, Great. <laughs> me and Lucy have been, we're banging the Monzo drum as I'm sure a lot of your, um, you know, your users are, um, your customers are. And, and it was amazing for us whilst we were traveling, you know, obviously there's loads of benefits abroad, mm. um, to, to using Monzo, but I, I received an email and it, and it basically said, yes, you've been having it was either zero fees or, you know, reduced fees for a certain period of time. And, yeah. you know, that's been great as we've started. However, here's the current situation of the company and we have a decision to make. We can either add fees like this and here's a potential option A, or we can do it in this way and it's charged on this basis. Yeah. So basically the fact that you, you're, you're, you're so transparent to the point when you're actually sharing your decision process with your customers and allowing them to have an input on that. That I mean, that was the first time that I, I, I used Monzo and liked it as a service, but I think that was the first time that I really, I guess, had a, had a deeper engagement with, with Monzo, which is absolutely what you know, we're seeing across loads of your customers. Yeah, and that, that moment for us, I think, was uh, one of the tipping points where up to then we'd, we'd let, sort of brought customers into decisions, but they were for relatively benign areas so what should we name this new feature or just sort of vote on which feature you think we should build next and we'll build it into our decision making process um but this was something where frankly we didn't know what the right answer was we knew that in order to be a sustainable business we had to find some way to limit cash withdrawals abroad um as we'd grown they just ended up costing too much money yeah um and so going out and and sharing exactly why we were doing that. We shared graphs from our internal dashboards to show how the cost per customer was going up and, and sort of explained exactly what it was. And obviously there were some people who were annoyed, but on the whole, what we found was people really identified with that. They really, they wanted us to become a, a sustainable business that was around for many, many years to come. Um, once we'd explained the decision making or the process as to how we got there, they understood. And I think it's a very rational decision. And so, they, course, they agreed yeah. with it and yeah it's hard to argue it completely flips it from we're increasing fees right that because that would be the traditional message isn't it we're increasing fees yeah. and I, i've received letters in the post before from whether it be um like tv companies or or, or banks it's like we're increasing fees and yeah. you know your reaction as a customer is great <laughs> when that the way that you've kind of positioned that has completely flipped it so not only are people happy to be a part of that decision but they're actually then telling the story as i'm doing now you know yeah. i don't know how many people i've told that story to it becomes like you know brand ambassadors etc yeah and i think on the whole that's where transparency works really well because if you are making rational decisions for the right reasons because they're 
overruling customers' benefit, um, then sharing those reasons and sharing the thinking behind it is just actually much more useful because it lets customers understand that as well and avoids some of that sort of, yeah, here's, here's your new terms and conditions letter with your new fees and, and deal with it. Um, and, and that's what we found with transparency all throughout um, the last few years. It's sometimes very difficult and very painful to do. It feels very unnatural, but mm. does the, it, the response... Does it feel unnatural sometimes? Is that, is that a challenge that you have? Yeah. Especially when things go wrong. So w- when things are going really well, it's very, very easy. Um, and it, it feels natural. You say, this is the way Monzo do things. We share our customer numbers. We share our growth. We share um, how we're thinking about the future and which exciting new features we're going to build. When things go wrong, I think that natural tendency, I don't know whether it's a hum- human tendency or whether it sort of comes from society or the way we see businesses operate in general, the natural tendency there is to just to shut down mm. and to try and brush it under the carpet or try and um, pretend it didn't happen or make it a, a smaller issue. And we've seen this when uh, the example I always use is sort of at the end of last year when uh, we were still on these prepaid cards and we were using a third party to, to process the payments and they went down for a day. And so people couldn't make payments for more than 24 hours on a Sunday. Right. Uh, which for a bank is, is pretty bad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and at that point, we basically had that option. Do we, do we follow a traditional crisis comms plan where you sort of hunker down, no one says anything, you get a PR agency, you release one statement to the media and uh, hope it all blows over? Or do you try and explain to customers exactly what happened? And that's what we tried to do. We sent an email to every single customer from our CEO explaining what had happened and what we were going to do to fix it. And again, explaining all of the details behind the decisions we'd made. Yeah. And that was picked up in the media. But the the amazing thing was that we received hundreds and hundreds of emails, or Tom, our CEO at least did, um, received hundreds of emails from customers who said, I was really upset with you before. I was really annoyed that I couldn't make a payment. And... I'm still upset and I'm still annoyed, but I now trust you even more. Yeah. It'll make me use Monzo even more because you've been honest with me and you've, you've showed me that you're going to learn from this and, and fix it. And yeah, so fighting that natural tendency to, to keep things quiet and, and continuing to share is, is an ongoing battle mm. and it's something that we need to continually talk about. We need to continually talk internally about to new employees uh, especially when they come from other companies that do things in a different way. Um, but also talk about externally because the ben- one of the huge benefits of having a really vocal community is that they call you out when things when you do things wrong. And they try they help you keep on the straight and narrow and act as that sort of voice that's outside the bubble of everyday life uh, internally. And so continuing to listen to that continuing to to nurture that i think is really important yeah well. yeah yeah it's a classic scenario isn't it of it's such an opportunity when you have um a, a, a an error or you know w- within customer service one thing i learned quite quickly is that there's such an opportunity when something goes really wrong you know unhappy customer mm. to, that's like your moment when you can actually flip that round and create a, a, a bond a trust with that customer in the way that you respond it's almost like your prime time to do that yeah and i think that as you said, that that example there kind of demonstrates that really. With- yeah, and I think that's the point where people can just become these huge, huge advocates of what you're doing. Um, yeah. Almost when they're at their most frustrated or, or vulnerable or whatever it is. Yeah. How do you, um, I'm really interested to know how you get feedback then, because at the moment now, the word's out, you've got so many people using your platform um, and, you know, people vote on features, you're getting all of this mm. feedback. There's, lo- I know, loads of, startups if we go back to kind of the early days that would potentially like this model of being transparent sharing things you know people voting on feature decisions and stuff like that um how do you prompt that particularly in the early days to actually get that engagement from people you just start really small that's what we did so um you our first uh hackathon we ran was a, a couple of weeks after i joined we invited 
we didn't have any customers. We didn't have a product at the time. Um, and so we just invited some friends and family uh, to come and, and sort of hack around on, a, on this bank with an API. Um, and the first one we had 15 people and we knew them all and yeah. it was a bit awkward and weird because they turned up expecting a, a proper hackathon, but it was great. And we spent two days and, um, just ordered in food and, uh, everyone had a really good time. And then we blogged about it and tweeted about it and, and shared. And then we hosted another a month later and 30 people came to that one and a few of them we didn't know, which was quite exciting. And we did the same thing. And then we ran another one a month later and 50 people and then 100 people. And by the fourth or the fifth one that we ran, we had to go to another venue because we had, didn't have space in our office. And we had 250 people. Interesting. Um, and it was, <laughs> it was crazy. And, and you could do that, I think, at every single level. Um, when we were trying to get feedback on the product, we would do customer interviews and get people in to our offices every single day. So I would do three or four interviews a day with people. And we would sit down and talk through we didn't have a product to show them so we would talk through how they currently use banking apps, so, so with their potential finances customers, are currently situated to clarify yeah with people i mean initially it was just with anyone who would come in uh because we were pretty desperate and long term we are building a product for everyone but then over time we start you start to build up a bit of momentum and you sort of get referrals from people who've already come in and so yeah talking to people who might use monzo but also people who might not to understand why wouldn't they yet? And where where are we missing? Interesting. Um, and what what's the specific? How did you get those? Even those first people? Were you you going to the street and asking them to come up? What, how are you? Yeah, we would. Um, first of all, you get a few friends of colleagues to come. Everyone sort of can convince one person to come who's vaguely interested in technology. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so that would get us going for the first week, and then we would ask the people who came if they could convince someone else to come. Um, and by then you start, you just sort of have a few people following you on Twitter. And so you can, um, we put a call out and said, Hey, does anyone want to come and see this new thing we're building? Um, we've been lucky. We'd had a little bit of press coverage. And so a few people there were sort of quite excited by this, this concept of building a, a, a new bank. Um, and, and you just grow out from there. We did some on the street as well, uh, accosting random people in the local, uh, what was it? An eat which right. was uh, not, not, a, not a moment I really enjoyed, but uh, something you have to do. And you just, just go from there. You start really, really small and just really slowly build up. And those, those chats were incredibly useful. You do them over and over again. And once you've done 50 or 100, you, you start to hear the same thing. Yeah. You can start to predict what they're going to say, basically, because you've heard the whole range of, of um, people. And that's the point where, you know, you can stop and you can move on to learning something new about, about it or testing out a new proposition. Yeah. Um, and that was how we did it really early on. And then once we had a hundred vaguely interested people, we started an online forum and said, why not put your thoughts on here? And then they started talking between themselves and that grew a bit. Um, and then that, that grew from there. And, and that's where sort of, I guess over time we got to where we are today interesting yeah i think that's i think that's great advice starting small and just building up from there um because i, I think to, there's this sort of that, gone the, well there's this this sort of big mantra in startups right of do things that don't scale yeah and we did that so much at the, at the beginning across everything we everyone used to pack the cards individually that we send out and so we had our ceo and the cfo and the, i mean the whole team it was only 15 people packing cards every day if we had a popular day because there was a press article, we would have to start earlier and no one would get any work done that afternoon because right. we had to send out the cards. Yeah. Um, you could just do the same thing across across almost everything. And what was the vision like though? Because I think a lot of people, um, they, they, they may understand they need to start small. It's not easy to start small mm. because, you know, like you said, if you do a first event and 10 people come, Sometimes that may be enough that if, if the vision's not there, someone drops the idea. They just, they just get discouraged, yeah. you know, and they don't, they don't then follow through to do that one where 20 people come and 30 people come. So I was quite late to the party in terms of hearing about Monzo, but what was the vision like? Was it a big, clear vision right from the start, which kind of helped navigate that? Yeah. So we've been really lucky in, in that sense, um, in that uh, Tom, our CEO and, and founder, had that very, very clear vision of what he wanted to build. 
And that's never really changed. So it's been going, Monzo's been going three and a half years. And throughout that time, the core vision has always been exactly the same. And you go and look and back, look back at early investment decks and, and they're basically saying the same thing as now. Right. But just we have a little bit more proof that we're onto something now and yeah. um, a, sort of a bit more detailed about it. So we've been very lucky that we haven't had to go through that quite traditional startup pivoting to try and find product market fit um, in that we, we haven't necessarily got the right product. Even now, I don't think we've sort of nailed that, but we've we really found the problem. Um, and Tom's always been very, very good at articulating where we're going in the long term and pulling people in behind him for that. And so I think from that point of view, that, that definitely helped. Um, and it especially helped in getting those early customers and those early hackathon attendees and the early um, user testing participants to, to get on board because they something about that clicked with them, something about what we were trying to build. Yeah. Where did the uh, where did the idea come from for Tom to have think, that vision? What experience did he go? Through? Yeah, so he um, his first major company was a company called Go Cardless, who are still around now. They do um, direct debit processing. So if you're a business and you need to to take direct debits online, you basically embed a piece of their code into your website, and you can then uh, process direct debits. And I think through that he got a glimpse into the banking sector and, and how broken it was right? and how um, focused on customers it was. And this sort of lodged itself in his mind at that point as something that he really, really wanted to fix. Um, so he built up GoCardless along with his co-founders uh, until it was at a point that it was pretty successful and running his own steam. And then at that point left GoCardless and, and, Went to do a few other things before before starting up Monzo, um, and a combination of that vision and, and good timing, uh, in that the regulation had been uh, changed slightly to encourage new competition and new entrants after the two thousand and eight financial crash, and um, I think people finally just getting frustrated that banking felt like it was fifty years behind frankly, even email, let alone social yeah. media or, or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, okay. And, and and he just formed that, that clear vision then. And, and, yeah, and, and he, 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 that's, that's how he started it. I think the first couple of engineers that joined were sold on this vision of building a bank with an API. Um, and and then it went from there. Yeah. Cool. So um, before we, we started recording there, we talked about your when you joined, which was, mm. you say, three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also before then, so what, what were you doing before you, you joined Monzo? So before Monzo, I was doing, uh, I was, it was very, very different. I was uh, living in Egypt and working for a, a refugee charity, um, trying to help people who'd come to Egypt as refugees, from mainly from sub-Saharan Africa, so Sudan and Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, they come to Egypt and they're given refugee status but they're not allowed to work or to access healthcare or to access education so it's not not much of a life and so i was working for a small charity trying to get people resettled to the u.s at the time uh, and europe and um, studying arabic as well so it was quite different to start up life um, very <laughs> but but also amazing <laughs> in a different way yeah so i can see the clear the clear connection then between that and Monza. <laughs> yeah exactly it's um i think the thing that really attracted me to monzo was partly that i wanted to to work in technology and, and in startups but that alongside this vision actually a key part of the vision was the social impact side of of what we're trying to do um because finances are so crucial to everyday life, they're so locked into everything you do. You can't get a job without a bank account. You can't get an apartment without a bank account. You basically can't do anything without a bank account, mm. um, especially in the UK. It acts as this gatekeeper to society. And it's traditional banking has been really bad at serving underrepresented people. Um, and, so even if 
super, super simple. If you move from France to the UK as an EU citizen to come and work here, it can take you three months to get a bank account because you can't get one until you've got an apartment that matches an address on your ID and you can't get a council tax letter that sort of supports your application until you've got an apartment and you just get stuck in this circle. Yeah. So what lots of people do is they use a friend's bank account for a couple of months, uh, which is is ridiculous. Um, and that's if you if you're coming as an EU worker um, and and with the privileges that are sort of associated with that. And so if you don't have that, if you're coming as a refugee or an asylum seeker or another group that finds it difficult to to sort of enter that world, um, it's much more difficult and is often impossible. And so a key part of what we were trying to build at Monzo, and we talk about it a lot, is initially we sort of verbalized it as building a bank for a billion people. This this is what our ambition. Okay. We now talk about it as making money work for everyone. Mm-hmm. And to make it work for everyone, you really need to tackle that, especially that financial inclusion piece, working out how do you get a bank account to literally everybody so that they can take part in society, so that they're not locked out because they don't have a bank account. And so we're very early days there, but we're now able to offer bank accounts to refugees in the UK, um, to recent immigrants, whether you come from France or somewhere else. Um, so, so is that is that uh, what's that sign up process look like now? Then super super simple. You as long as you've got a form of photo ID that can be your passport uh, of almost any national passport, a national ID card um, can be a biometric residence permit, which lots of refugees get in the UK. Um, Anything that's issued by a government, excluding a few sort of sanctioned countries, um, and has your photo on, you can open an account with, and you just take a photo of that. Take a little six-second selfie video of yourself, which is uh, weird and embarrassing and awkward. But yep. um, that's all you need. And then we'll, we'll give you a full bank account. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. And so we're just getting started there. There are two million people in the UK who don't have bank accounts, adults. But um, it feels like we've got a chance to have a really huge impact there yeah absolutely no that's awesome and, and coming back to egypt what mm. did you what did you learn there we talked off air about the the different pace of life yeah what, 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 what were the similar things that you learned there so i found cairo is a city of 25 million people with uh basically no order and uh, no organization and and at the time i was there very little um in terms of sort of policing and in a way, that was great for coming to London because it made London seem calm and uh, easy to live in. Right, which made London calm. People, yeah, that tend not to tends not to be the case. Um, I think the, the other big difference that I found was that people just have a very different attitude to life. And moving to London, we found life becomes very regimented, very organised, very structured. Um, you have to book up to see friends four weeks in advance in, their, in a slot in their calendar. And in Egypt, people valued, they valued the here and now much more than the future. And so if you're doing something right now with friends or you see someone on the street, then it's much more important to go and grab a coffee with them or do something with them than worrying about the plan that you've got for the future. And so I would often fall into this trap where I was on the way to meet someone and you'd see someone else. Uh, and I'd say, sorry, I can't stop. Got to have this, uh, appointment. And they would, they would read that as being very, very rude. And vice versa. It also means everyone is constantly late to everything, which as a British person was very hard to, to deal with. Uh, especially initially I spent many hours waiting for people in coffee shops, but, um, I really liked. I really, really liked it. It was. I think it was work. Work was seen as necessary in order to live your life, but it didn't become this all-consuming thing that I think it often is in the UK and in London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you think that's and has that changed your approach now? Um, pr- probably not as much as it should. It's very easy to get caught up in in the day to day. Uh, especially initially when I started at Monza, I sort of threw myself into um, into work life and working here, and 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 all of, the sort of downside of, of things like that. That really strong vision is that uh, you 
can become all consumed by it. Yeah. And so I spent my first year only thinking about Monzo, only working at Monzo, working long hours and, and just constantly being mentally engaged. What do the hours, what do the hours look like just on that? Well, overall, very, very good. We've, and and we, we've got much better at it. And um, so now we sort of are very flexible on when people come in. Most people are in before 10. Uh, some people come in at 7. And then you leave at the right time for you. So people who come in at 7. And what about you personally at the start? At the start, they were... The reason I ask is I think there's you know, a misconception. I, I talked to a lot of people about work life, work-life balance. And I'm um, just yeah. always interested to hear what... In those early days of of starting you know being in a high growth business yeah what, what actually is required from you what what effort did you actually put in um hours wise headspace wise so probably in in hours wise it was probably something like 10 till 7 um i think the bigger thing was headspace wise um the downsides of modern technology is that you have slack and email on your phone constantly yeah and so I would be constantly on them. I would see every new message that came into Slack within two minutes and I'd be replying to it. I'd be sort of engaging. I'd be working constantly, but just on this on-off basis that Mm. sort of takes over your life um, without you realizing it. And then it becomes very, very hard to disconnect and you're just constantly using up your brain space for work. Um, And... It's a really difficult balance. I don't know what the answer is, especially early on. I think some of, sometimes that's really necessary. When you're starting out a new company and you could die at any moment, I think, I don't think you can go into it with an expectation that you'll work nine to five every day and that work will never seep in. But I, I still think you can find that balance where you can accept that sometimes there will be times where you're working like crazy for a week or two um, for whatever reason, but just not having that unhealthy relationship where you then don't take a holiday or you don't take time off or you don't bring your hours back to normal. Yeah. Um, And since then I've, I think I now have a very or a much more healthy relationship with work um, where I don't have email on my phone. I don't have Slack on my phone. I never, if I leave work, I won't ever do any work. Um, at home really so i can probably count on one hand the number of times i've worked at home when i haven't been sort of planning to work from home for the day wow um it doesn't mean i haven't done late nights in the office sometimes but i try to keep that separation very very strict um, yeah and you've actually you yeah, have taken really, really off helps. the the apps from your phone have you you've not got mail on your phone slack well, I, so I still have them, but I don't have notifications on. And then I have this rule with myself that I just don't open them. Right. Um, and so I've, it's still useful for during the daytime. But um, outside of that, it's, uh, yeah, turning, I don't know what it was. I, I found I would get this sort of start feeling anxious if I was thinking about work in my personal time. Uh, and keeping them separated just was hugely beneficial it's, it's the way i work i'm a sort of very all or nothing person and so um I, I i'm not very good at doing things halfway and so that's probably part of it um, yeah yeah you know, others who do it, do it much more sanely than me uh-huh. okay and really interesting so now your your title is head of marketing and community isn't it mm. so what was the progression to, to reach that role what, what did you what did you start monzo as yeah again another accident i um so i joined as a community manager originally um, which was basically doing social media. And it was um, just a way into a startup for me. Uh, is that how you, is that how you, how you saw it? Did you see that as yeah, a way totally. into a startup? Yeah, I, um, I basically, I moved back, came, moved back to the UK, came to London and, and knew I wanted to try out a tech startup in a, in a sort of very idealistic way. And so I applied for three or four companies and, um, I would love to say that I saw the potential of Monzo and predicted how successful it would be. And then so he signed up, but um, they interviewed me first and, and gave me an offer first. And at the time <laughs> I thought that if you didn't accept the offer really quickly, they might rescind it. <laughs> uh, and so I accepted it really quickly before I'd had my other interviews. Right. <laughs> um, the people seemed really, really smart and really nice. And I really liked the idea, but at the time there was not that much more to it. 
Uh, and so it was just this incredibly lucky, lucky choice at the time. And so I started in community management, um, ran those first hackathons, started on our, started out our forum, started out our social media, and then through a sort of very random series of events, ended up being a product manager and, and helping to build out our first Android app. Right. And then, again, um, through a, a sort of series of events, um, took over running the marketing team about two years ago now. Um, and that felt, I'd always had this weird relationship with marketing where I didn't think I liked it. I'm still not, not really sure, but um, <laughs> um, right. having that experience doing, doing that. <laughs> well, so far as sort of bumbling along at least. Um, <laughs> yeah, having that experience in those other teams, especially in product, was incredibly useful. Uh, we are a product and engineering driven company. And so understanding how mobile apps and how uh, tech products are built um, yeah. is really useful. I think you often get this divide between marketing and other other teams at a lot of companies. So yeah, trying absolutely. to reduce that as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and so you you literally started up the, the socials, all of that. You know, your your communication that you that you use so heavily now. You, you started those those areas. Yeah, we had a we had a Twitter account when I joined. I think uh, maybe a Facebook account, but we didn't really know what to do with it, or um, no one no one used it. So we would just tweet out every week or so when someone would remember that we we had one. Um, and again, that for us, especially in the beginning, was about and when we got our first few customers, thinking about how do we do customer service in a way that's that really works for how people use their their banks or sort of how people interact with their day to day lives. So, how do yeah. we meet them in the place that they are, rather than saying, if you need customer service, you have to follow this set of steps in order mm. to do anything. You have to call us up and go through a phone tree and press all the right buttons and get into a place where we want you to be we we came at it from the point of view of how do we how do we solve people's problems where they're asking us how do we solve them on twitter when they message us how do we solve it on facebook immediately without forcing them to go through that pre pre-functioned flow um and so that was part of where we started thinking about how do we how do we do custom service in the right way yeah. Do you think that a lot of that comes back to having a very, very clear vision? Because it, because you know then what you're you're trying to achieve. You know, it sounds like when when you actually went for the interview, that vision is probably what grabbed your attention. So it helps mm-hmm. obviously in recruitment as well. But then, you know, there's I'm sure there's many many marketing teams in small and large businesses that that you may just hit that role and do what you. Th- think is right and what you've done before what i think with monzo is there's a clear thought process like you said then about okay i'm, I'm starting like what what message do we want to share and how yeah. can we reach the people where they are that's like a very thought through process you've, you've almost been given the license to to have that level of thinking as opposed to just fulfilling a marketing role yeah you know what i mean yeah i think it was a combination of um hiring a really really strong team our initial team uh, as our team is now, but was just incredibly strong. They were super smart, very, very motivated. And a lot of them, a lot of us hadn't done what we were doing before. I mean, no, no one had started a bank before. Yes. Um, <laughs> but a lot of people, like, I'd never done marketing before. Um, Leah, who started all of our customer service, had, had never done customer service or run customer service before. And so that combined with this desire to think about things from first principles to under, really understand the problems and really understand why we're building certain solutions rather than just doing them in the way they've always been done. Yeah. I think it was what helped us to do that. Um, and we, we got it wrong a lot for sure as well. I, there definitely wasn't a case of uh, knowing exactly what to do and doing it. And then it was successful. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. there are lots and lots of missteps and there, there are all the time every day still, but um I think coming at those, coming at it from a fundamentals point of view is incredibly valuable. Uh, it comes with its downsides as well. You have to, we sometimes fall into the trap of constantly reinventing the wheel and saying, how can we do this better? And spending a couple of months coming at it 
from that first principles point of view and then coming to the same solution that uh, sometimes things are just done the way they are be- because they're better. Uh, and that's the best way to do it. Um, it's very hard to predict when that's the case in advance. So yeah, yeah, that's true. We're trying to trying to balance that out um, over time, and except that yeah, there are experts as well who can, sure. who can do things better. Yeah. And and what, what what are you focusing on now then? What's the where's where's Martin yeah. going? What, what's he going to do with his twenty million first of all? And then what, what's <laughs> it, what are you looking to do personally? So I think the next. The next year for Monzo is where we really get going. We've spent three and a half years basically getting the basics ready. So getting a banking license, getting our first million customers, building out features that you would expect from a normal bank account, doing them in a Monzo way, but still but basically just building a bank account, transfers and um, international payments and cash deposits and all of that sort of thing. And 2019 is going to be the time where we can take that and just supercharge it in every way possible. Mm -hmm. So growing much, much faster. This year we went from 400,000-ish to 1.2 million customers. Next year we're thinking about how do we bring on millions more just next year. Yeah. Um, How do we build out features that help us to do that? How do we start driving revenue as a company so that we can become sustainable in the long term? It basically takes everything we've got and we just have to 10x it. And we've now got the team in place to do that. We've got 600 employees. We've got uh, a great office in, in London and two satellite offices in Cardiff and, and the States. And so we're, it feels like we've got all of those pieces with a great product and customers that are, are really, really happy. So we can now push really, really hard and um, go from being that small bank that's doing quite well and growing quite fast to... Um, the bank that Barclays and HSBC are really, really, really worried yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not why we do things, but I think it would be quite fun as well. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> and uh, I, I really want to ask you actually about the, the approach with the golden ticket. You know, the fact mm. the fact you're, so for people that don't know, you, you couldn't sign up for Monzo um, immediately. Previously, yeah. you, you can now, anyone can now sign up, can't they? Yep. Previously, you had a, you had to be referred for the use of a golden ticket. So, what, why why that approach? What was behind that? Mm. So, we had this waiting list, and again, that started out at the beginning, especially um, from a practical point of view, because we were hand packing those cards, and you just you can't send out. Uh, there's a limited number of cards that you can hand pack every day and still get some work done. And so, we set up a waiting list to to sort of let us control that, so that we could choose how many we would send out each day. Um, and over time that grew and became a really powerful growth tool as well, where we would let people invite their friends in order to, to bump themselves up the list and, and then eventually evolved into this golden tickets, um, feature where you could, to certain people, we would give golden tickets and then they could invite a friend to totally skip the queue. Um, that was amazing for growth, but, but really came about just from a practicalities point of view. Um, towards the end, obviously, we were sending out cards uh, slightly more in a slightly more sophisticated way than uh, <laughs> the CEO yeah. hand packing them. But um, it still acted as this really useful gate where we could make sure that if in one day there was a big PR spike and twenty thousand people signed up, that we um, were able to manage their expectations. Um, and yeah, there was something about golden tickets that just really, really, really clicked with customers. Um, Definitely. it's actually the idea of, of one of our investors. And, um, I think a combination of, of scarcity. Yeah. So it, them not being immediately available and feeling, feeling special when you were both given one and when you gave one and then when you received one, uh, it just meant that they worked really, really well for us and yeah. drove, 40% of our growth for a couple of years. Really? Yeah, definitely. I'm not, I'm not surprised by that because it, it is that feeling of scarcity, that kind of, you know, that this is so in demand that you, you can't just access it, you know? Yeah. It's interesting. Like you said, that was actually initially designed because you were just struggling to handle, but, but even then you could have been tempted to just keep the gate open, you know, keep, keep that happening. But then what you would have done, I guess, is disappoint the customers when they have to wait so long. Yeah. But I'm sure a lot of people also could have taken that approach. Yeah, I think there's a lot of value. In, it's partly transparency, but it's just sort of overall <clears throat> keeping customers happy by 
making sure that they understand what's happening and, and managing their expectations in, in, in both a good way and sort of hyping people up, but also making sure that we don't want to, someone's first interaction with Monzo to be one of disappointment where you think you're going to get a card and then you have to wait three weeks. So yeah. um, constantly trying to balance that was really difficult. And at times the waiting list was uh, a month and a half and that was too long. People understandably would lose interest and, and get frustrated. Um, and so then we worked really, really hard to bring that down. And by the end, we got it down to sort of just under a week. And that was, I think, the sweet spot for having a waiting list. Um, but again, now being able to get rid of that is also really beneficial because you start to, people have the, it's funny how customers and, and wider society ingrain certain beliefs about how a company works. And that can be really, really hard to change. So even now we get people who say, oh, I haven't signed up to Monzo because I know that I have to wait. Oh, um, really? Which obviously isn't true, but it takes a long time to get that out of people's consciousness. Yeah. Well, that is interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a slow process. We're getting there. Hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Justin, I just want to ask you two more questions. Um, first of all, is what, what's been the hardest part for you in, in your time at Monzo? I think the last few months. I think we go... When you're a company of 600 people and you're growing, you probably on board 20, 25 new employees every week. Uh, you're, 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 you go from being a small startup that can figure things out as you go along to being a, a proper company. And for me personally, that's been by far the biggest challenge because I'd never worked in a proper company before. Right. Um, and so it was, I felt much more comfortable at doing that 20 person thing, figure it out um, day to day. And now you have to think about processes, think about um, hiring, uh, hiring constantly. Yeah, I bet. Um, 25 a week. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of those are in custom support, um, yeah. but it still means the, the company as a whole is growing very, very fast. And so I think that's been by far the biggest challenge, um, scaling up and understanding that you need it's no longer just in your individual control or my individual control it's about building a really really strong team um who can execute on it rather than just a few key people who are who are very strong personally because that just doesn't work at scale yeah um, and they will burn out and it's not it's not repeatable and it doesn't work when they go on holiday and all of that sort of thing so yeah that's been a, a interesting and and very challenging challenge over the last few yeah, years yeah and we'll continue we'll continue <laughs> yeah it only gets worse that's the problem every every six months the, you look back and the things you're <laughs> stressing about and worried about seem tiny um which is also the fun and, and that's i think part of what keeps me going but uh yeah it never at some point i guess it gets easier but then it probably gets boring because you've built a company that's like ibm or something and then yeah then you have fewer challenges yeah yeah, yeah. We're we're away off that absolutely. And on the flip side, then what's been the what's been the best part for you? The positive impact that we're having on people's lives now is something we've talked about for a long, long time. But the first year was about building a bank. Second year was about getting a bank account, banking license, and so we're now at that point where we can build features and products that really improve people's lives. Whether that's giving people bank accounts um, more easily or We've recently launched a, a gambling block feature to help people who are, who are struggling with gambling. Um, and so they can turn that off right at the source at their bank account. And those things that are actually quite small scale, you might hear from 10 people, but you hear from 10 people about how it's changed their lives and in some cases saved their lives. And having that positive impact as a company and, and for me personally is just hugely rewarding and um, inspiring. And Combining that with the scale that we're about to reach um, makes me really, really excited for the next few years where we can bring that to tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, hopefully, um, really improve their yeah. lives. Yeah, awesome. Okay, nice one. Tristan, where can, um, if people want to sign up to Monzo or find you, what, what links do they need to, to know about? Where can they find you? Yeah, they can sign up at monzo.com, download the app. Um, you can follow us on, on the social medias uh, at Monzo on Twitter. And then I'm personally at 
Tristan Thomas with none of the vowels on Twitter. Unfortunately, I joined too late to get a, a good <laughs> we've, all, we've all experienced some element of that problem, I'm sure. Um, awesome. I've once put, I've recently put on my LinkedIn that I think um, Monza have managed to achieve something, which is that they haven't got engaged customers. I think you've actually got some raving fans. So, um, you know, I'm, mm. a, I'm a, a huge believer in that you're, you're doing some great things. So wish, wish you all the best. People call it a cult sometimes, which I'm not sure <laughs> if that's a compliment or not. But Yeah, uh, <laughs> I take it as one. Well. Um, yeah, exactly. So Tristan, thanks for joining me. Really appreciate your time. No worries. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I really hope you found that interesting and useful. If you did, I'd love it if you would head over to iTunes and hit subscribe to this podcast. You'll be the first to know when we release new episodes in the future. Also, come and join in the conversation on our socials. We're Life Design Diaries on Instagram and at Life Design Pod on Twitter. So once again, thanks a lot and see you soon.